Pranista, you are not audible. Uh, I hope I'm audible now. Uh, yes, you are now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the centenary celebration of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIEST Shepherd. Today, we are here for the eighth lecture under the centenary lecture series by our honorable alumnus, Mr. Indrajit Singh, on the topic mechanical engineers and manufacturing industry. Today's uh, lecture would be chaired by Professor Shudipto De. He is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in Jadavpur University and our alumnus of the batch 89. Sir, please take over. Ah, it's my great pleasure. I mean, saying my all my seniors attending, I'm also attending this program serially, not all the lectures, but most of the lectures i'm really expressing my i mean deep joy and all my uh, i'm very much enthusiastic to see professor mallik also in the same ochudda also and the other seniors and mr indrajit shen he i know him from my close association with bengal chamber for a long time because he was the president of that uh, chamber and I was also working in at least two committees simultaneously at that time in uh, Energy Environment Committee and the Education Committee. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Shen. Mr. Indrajit Shen graduated in a bachelor in bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Bengal Engineering College, our original name. We all are the B collegeite, we call it rather than IAST, though it is a new name. Shippur, Calcutta University in 1961. In fact, I'm very honest to admit that it is beyond when I was born, he was a long. He has a long and illustrious industrial career spanning over sixty years. Obviously, that has to be then. He, I mean, he graduated before my birth. He started his professional journey with Barn and Co. Howrah in 1965. Joined Hugli Docking and Engineering Company, a shipbuilding and ship repairing company belonging to Martin Barn Group, as its works manager and plant head. In 1971, Mr. Sain joined International Combustion India Limited as the head of engineering and manufacturing. And since 1989, he is the managing director of the company. I also knew him initially from that uh, affiliation. He has also been on the board of Stone India Limited. Mr. Shen has been the president of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry during 2018-19 and led the BCCI business delegation to Germany in 2019. I know that phenomenon also and he has very close association with Germany I know he also has been the regional chairman and council member of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce in recognition of his contribution to the industry Calcutta Management Association bestowed upon him the prestigious corporate leadership award International Combustion India Limited manufactures a wide range of heavy duty industry industrial machinery and high precision industrial equipment under technology joint ventures with various leading companies from Germany, Spain, UK, USA, and Brazil. The company is very active in several industrial sectors such as mining, uh, mineral beneficiation, steel, power, sugar, chemical, pharmaceutical, food and beverage, and construction industry. In his talk, I think that's the most suitable thing with such a ex, such an experience and illustrious career. Mr. Shen will share his vast industrial experience and to touch upon what manufacturing industries expect from mechanical engineering graduate. Sir, I should not waste any more time. I should, I mean, offer the stage to you. And also, I'm just requesting others to, I mean, those who have the uh, uh, unmute option keep your microphone mute and as I, we have just discussed he will make a presentation not with presentation but with that in a, in a talk mode so we can have the interactions just after he finishes and in between if you have some queries you can put into the chat box also so i welcome mr Shen, and it will be my great pleasure to listen to him thank you thank you uh, professor shudhude for the kind introduction thank you professor Shudip Ghosh, head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering of IIEST. Even, even today, I just feel 
I always like to feel like saying, okay, Bengal Engineering College Shippur, but then it has changed its name, of course. For I thank uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Uh, Professor Shudip Ghosh for inviting me to be the speaker at this eighth centenary lecture and share my thoughts. I, I first like to mention that I am not an academician, but a person from industry, and that too from uh, industrial machinery manufacturing industry. Two of my contemporaries, <coughs> Professor Achyut Ghosh, who is my batchmate, and Professor Omitabo Ghosh, who is one year junior to me, uh, had been uh, already, has already shared their thoughts at this forum. Omidabo, as we all know, is an outstanding academician of unparalleled repute, and Ochut is an exceptional engineer and a designer as well as an academician. They have, and some others, have already enriched this forum by sharing in their thought, knowledge and thoughts. And all I shall do is bring in a topic which is not normally discussed. During my time in uh, Shippur Engineering College, I was fortunate to have some of the great minds and great teachers. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute and acknowledge their contribution, which helped me in my subsequent professional life. I had great teachers like Principal Professor A.C. Roy, Professor Durga Banerjee, Professor Bhupal Dotto, Professor Omitabh Bhartchurch, Professor Rajat Chakraborty, Professor Bimal Shain, Professor Dhruva Rai, Professor Shankar Shain, Professor Van Vliet of Wisconsin University, and many, many, many others. I mean, they have actually given me the knowledge, given me the strength to pursue my subsequent career. And this is my tribute to them. 60 years back, when I graduated as a mechanical engineer from this premier Heritage Institute, I had two options. One was, of course, to go to Wisconsin University, where I had already got the admission. I had the assistantship and also chance to work with uh, part time work with Alice Chalmers, Wisconsin plant. Uh, in fact, surely it was much easier during those days to get the uh, admission, assistantship, and others. It is much, much more tougher, I know, this time. This time. And also I had the option to join the industry, which I did, and I joined Howrah Burn as management trainee. Uh, Professor Shudip Tode has already more or less explained what international combustion does and what I have, in, uh, I have uh, pursued my professional career. But let me just give a few more information about international combustion, India Limited where I'm associated for since 1971, which is a long, long period of time. This company has been present in Indian market for more than 85 years. And it started its journey as a fully held uh, British company. In fact, it was a subsidiary of fully held subsidiary of International Combustion UK. And our main work at that time was er erection of uh, boilers in various thermal power plants. In fact, we were one of the leading, international combustion was a, the global leaders in thermal power plant and boiler manufacturing. Of course, uh, at a later point of time, the company shifted its focus and became a man manufacturing company of various kinds of uh, industrial machinery. And uh, we started our journey with a plant in Vidabati in near Calcutta. In 1989, the company finally became the fully head because at the time, in 1989, the, uh, the UK company was taken over by Rolls-Royce. And during that time, of course, the government regulations did not prevent the companies to be, you know, the shareholding was the, was the issue of the foreign holding. So the company then became an Indian company, and it is today a public limited company, but, but Indian public limited company. As uh, Professor, uh, they had already mentioned, the company manufactures wide, wide range of industrial machinery, starting with heavy uh, engineering machinery for heavy, heavy duty industrial machinery, 
for steel plants, mining, etc. Also highly precision gearboxes and gear motors. And uh, uh, recently, of course, company has also started a little non-engineering sector because it's kind of a, you can say that in a kind of an inorganic uh, diversification. And we are also now in the field of uh, uh, construction chemicals and uh, uh, you know, uh, building material and so on and so forth. We have plants near Calcutta at Bhuldubati. We have plants in, uh, in Maharashtra, two plants in Maharashtra, in Nagpur and uh, in Aurangabad. We have, have a plant in Ajmer. And uh, uh, I mean, we are, we are looking at various options to move in various places also. Uh, West Bengal is also very much in our focus. <clears throat> Recently, I was just mentioning just some time back that uh, we have some two of the engineers from uh, Shippur Engineering College who joined us a few years back as management training, I think three, four years back. And recently I had the opportunity to speak with them as to, as to what did they expect when they decided to come to the industry. I asked them what were they were starting a professional career, they were coming from college, what did they expect? And they told me they expected to join production or design. Surprisingly, this is exactly the same notion that I had 60 years back when I, when, when I, when I came out of the college and joined industry. Where do I go? I go to, go to production or design. Now, <laughs> this is quite amazing, amusing for me because even at that time I did not know what was to expect? What was I to? What uh, was it, was expected in either of these two areas? I mean, I didn't know that. Now, okay. Now you see, uh, time has changed. I must also mention here that uh, today, uh, people who join come to the industry are sometimes better prepared. But during our time, there was no management schools. That was the time when I came out of the college. There was no management schools. Today, of course, the students have a lot of options. Uh, they have, uh, they can, they can after graduation, they can join uh, various business schools in uh, in India or abroad. They can pursue a master's course in various universities in India and abroad. They can, of course, join universities and uh, join industries. And at the same time, they can also be, and this is we have seen very often. We are seeing this. They can be the innovators and they can be the entrepreneurs. In fact, my friend Achyut Ghosh is, even during my time, he was an entrepreneur. I like, uh, this is truly when I talk about engineers, industry, whatever, this is a huge canvas. And not being a person from the academics, I would only like to cover opportunities and requirements of mechanical engineers who join who plan to join manufacturing industry or industry per se. Even when we talk about industry, there are multiple sectors where mechanical engineers are required. And some of these are manufacturing sectors for mass production, such as auto industry, auto components, white goods industry, manufacturing sector for industrial machinery and components thereof, Metallurgical sector, including foundries, forgings, base metal manufacturing sector, such as steel, aluminium, copper, mining sector, power generation distribution sector, process industry sector, including cement, chemical, petrochemicals, and similar industries, food and food processing sector, uh, electronics, IT, and IT sector, and many, 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 many others. This again, being a huge canvas, is distinctly different and has its own demands and requirements. While each of these industrial sector engages a large number of mechanical engineers, the function are widely different. To, def to deliberate in all these sectors, even to touch them, is a huge task and I, would, I will not try like to try to do that. So I will just like to narrow it down to the sector, which is engaged in manufacture of industrial plant and machinery and 
most of the operational functions of this sector. You see, when an industry works, most of the operational functions are very similar. I mean, you take one industry as an example, and it's become very similar to the other industry also. So I would like to try to do that. And if time permits, I will briefly speak or touch on mass production, such as auto and auto components or white goods. One of the major challenges that a new entrant to the industry, having, I mean, having, uh, I mean, when they come to the industry from being a graduate or a postgraduate with a postgraduate degree, is they are not being fully aware of how the industry works and what the industry expects of them. What would make them successful in their professional career? This is a major challenge. I therefore decided to speak about how industry and especially manufacturing industry works for better understanding of the young engineers who have recently graduated or will do so in a short period of time. To help them to understand, this is to help them to understand the, the and map their professional path in looking at the long term and what they want, what they don't want, what they prefer, what is their focus, and to help them to do map the match properly. I also like to state that while every industry have many, many operating verticals, when I talk about it, you'll see that we'll be talking about many verticals, many verticals. To be successful, this is sometimes is also a confusion with young engineers that okay, they also feel, always feel that if I go to this vertical, I'll be more successful in life. It doesn't happen. So it's every vertical, every vertical, one can be successful professional. All one has to do is to work hard. And there's no specific vertical which, which gives any fast track or slow track. So the growth comes from every vertical, provided one is excellent in his work, is hardworking and focused, willing to take challenges, and most importantly, have strong desire and confidence to grow by his own skill and competence. And all manufacturing, now coming back to what all manufacturing companies do, all manufacturing companies have different operational verticals. To name a few, sales and marketing, design and technological technology development, manufacturing and industrial engineering, quality assurance, supply chain management, maintenance, IT and data management, administration, human resource and human resource development, finance and legal, and of course, of course, uh, one has to also cannot forget that uh, adoption of newer management techniques. See, every day the new techniques are changing and new techniques are coming to the field and these are very important. And so all of these are individual verticals and uh, I will not really, I mean, these verticals are uh, one, point of, one point of time, a professionally successful engineer will have to understand the nuances of each of these verticals. That's not, I'm surely how will happen. But today I will only limit myself to those verticals, few verticals where an engineer is most likely, who is joining the industry, is most likely to be exposed to. And this is what's important for them to understand. Let me start. Let me start by saying, what? Where does a mechanical engineer fit in marketing? After that, I'll go a few of them, and then that's how I'll explain. For most manufacturing company, and this is true, for most manufacturing company, all products are manufactured as a combination of standard assembly of or service assembly. To, together with other certain parts which are tailor made. We are, I'm not talking, of course, I'm not talking about job working companies. I mean, these are, uh, they don't have any such issues. Somebody gets, wants to get certain thing done and they do that. I'm talking about the companies who have their own product line. The marketing engineer has to choose the optimum solution and size of the machinery or equipment to meet exactly what the client wants. For this, 
while they shall surely use various application tools, softwares, many of them, even they will develop themselves, but they must also have deep knowledge of various aspects of engineering, be it material science, be it uh, um, applied mechanics, whatever, to optimize the selection and prepare the preliminary design. In fact, they are also expected in marketing today, they're also expected to do a preliminary design of the equipment itself so that they can offer the, uh, make, make, make a price offer. The marketing engineers also will have to interact very, very uh, deeply with the clients, with the buyers, and they have to speak a lot about the technological aspects of what they are trying to offer. And this will help the client to choose and come to the correct decision. When then I would also like to, this is briefly what an, what an engineer does in a marketing or a setup in an organization. I will move to design and technology de development. Based on the technical specification, clients place the order, uh, order and the design engineers starts immediately developing the detail and design of the machine or equipment, including all associated parts. This is a big job, of course, with the, uh, with the care being there, it's much simpler these days. The design is, all designs are then subjected to, okay, it depends, of course, it depends on the type of design one is talking about, but most designs are subjected to, immediately after that, to finite and element analysis. I mean, uh, FEA, it has to be subject to that. And many, many of the designs are also subjected to a natural frequency analysis to check whether the whether the equipment will will be in the zone of the uh, natural frequency. I mean, uh, that's where it will run. And if it's so, then they have to modify the design to move away at least at least, uh, at least 100 RPM or uh, away from the 100 to 100 RPM away from the natural frequency. That's very important. And then, and after that, this is only, this is done, this, these kind of checks are actually done in industry to see for long-term security and uh, safety of the equipment. The knowledge, again here, the knowledge of material science, applied mechanics, and many other aspects of engineering. I mean, practically all aspects of engineering comes in here a little bit. And knowledge of manufacturing process, because you, when you are drawing something, when you're designing something, you must remember it has to be manufactured also. It's excellent to do it on the on the drawing board. It's very nice, but possibly it's not. It cannot be um, manufactured. I mean, it is. It very often happens very often actually, and so then they have to have the knowledge of manufacturing, manufacturing processes, and uh, a good designer also have also have, and this is something that I would want all the young engineers to remember. A good designer must also be aware of the maintenance requirement, the accessibility of maintenance. I have seen people designing and sending equipment and then people are wondering, how do I change the liner? How do I enter the uh, bunker? How do I do that? I mean, it's impossible really. It becomes a terrifying situation then. So they must also be very much aware of the accessibility and the maintenance requirement. But uh, what's happening today is uh, many companies, in fact, like companies like us, we have a lot of technical collaboration, joint ventures from reputed overseas companies. We do not rediscover the wheels actually. So when we get those technology in, what we do, and this is what the engineers are required to do, to adopt those designs for manufacturing in India. Because India has a little different specification, uh, different availability, so it has to be adopted for that. And we also upgrade because the working environment also in Indian condition are a little different, a uh, little different than what happens in many other countries in Europe, like Europe. So the adoption of the uh, collaborated design for Indian manufacturing and also accepting that certain things has to be strengthened a little bit more for Indian environment is something that the engineers do. Another area 
where extensive amount of work of a very high level engineering is done is in the in the area of in-house product development most most companies also have in-house product development programs and a lot of work of engineering is done there and then see they, they both not only uh, with the design of the drawing board but then take the prototype do the testing do the modification and all these are done by the engineers who are with the in the group of design and technology development this is a vast area of course but and uh, i would not go deeper into this at the moment because uh, it's literally a very big area uh, i would now come to the area which is manufacturing this is an area which has actually seen and is continuing to see a sea of change it's not the same when we started our work six years back obviously it was not the same and in the last even in the last few decades it has just transformed totally differently uh, in fact the philosophy of manufacturing it itself has changed and changed dramatically because mostly mainly because a very sharp big strong development in it and it technology this has helped to change all concept of manufacturing uh, for example for machining of components the conventional uh, machine semi automatic machine or so called automatic machines which we used to use earlier are all gone and these have been uh, we, because these were all to great extent dependent on to some extent at least dependent on human skills today's manufacturing philosophy does not require so much human skills because they are not only the productivity is challenged but also the, the consistency is challenged and so today you have we have we use machines i mean these all these machines have been replaced by something which we call fire five axis machines seven axis machines these are all cnc machines with even positional accuracy of okay very crude posi positional accuracy can be of 5 microns even it could be even 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 better it could even be 2 microns and these are these being 5 axis 7 axis machines they are uh, they have uh, multiple axis working capability when i talk about 5 axis what i mean is that you see we have three basic axis x y z you know x and then y and then z is the other axis then you have rotational axis that means the uh, speed which at which it cut it turns that's fourth axis then you have the table which also turns on its own for manufacturing that's the fifth axis then the table turns in the other direction also which is sixth axis and the another it turns the, in the uh, tilts in other direction that's the seventh axis now when you think of a machine which does all that and so all operations related to this and now the, these machines are this uh, machines are so so intelligent i mean they choose they select they remember where one the multiple tools maybe we are using 40 50 60 tools at a time or, or even more and the machines remembers where in which one tool is kept and mind you this is not true that you see when the, when the tool is changed by the machine it i it puts it any pocket and remembers that it's not that it goes to the same pocket with every time that happens then lot of movement of the tool changer takes place and that's not allowed actually it takes too much of time now when i talk about it so today cnc machines have become truly very intelligent and human intervention has gone down uh, drastically in preparing the program and loading or unloading the workpiece and even that is getting changed when you talk about loading and loading most places we use robots and then it's multifunctional robots robots also does automatically the checks the dimensional accuracy certain critical dimension accuracy and sorts and puts their good ones on one side bad ones on the other side but you see what has happened also that because of the advancement of the cam softwares the programs and the also corresponding hardware all these machines and all this movement which happens 
all the programming which is done, it's either done on the controller itself or it is done offline. And I mean, everything, all tool paths are plotted and it, the program itself writes down its own, uh, you know, own uh, G code and inputs. I mean, it just does it on its own. I mean, that's it. So all these programming, all the selections, all the decisions, like some decisions that like you have to put in while the programming is being drawn. And that is where the engineers come in in a very big way. And the other aspect of it is that when I'm talking about positional accuracy of a machine, I'm also, one must remember, the accuracy of the fixture which holds the job is also an important factor, huge factor. And designing of the right fixture for holding the job and positioning the job is a matter of great importance. And there, there we use the engineers extensively and they make a great job. I must also mention that, uh, uh, okay, the machines today are so, so intelligent that uh, they also do their auto health check. They do their own health check and they inform the control center that, okay, this one needs attention. So immediately the preventive maintenance gets activated. While I'm trying to do that, I mean, what we always say is sometimes um, people ask me, people have asked me many times that, okay, are we taking away the men, the human, human from doing the active work? I said, no, you see engineers, engineers are meant for much, much more high level. They're not meant for just turning, machining this, that, what not, or supervising. That's not their job, actually. They are very well trained. They're very skilled. They have other jobs to do, and that is where we try to take them over. Now, having said this, I must also mention that while, while I'm talking about machines, I must also mention that even the tool engineering has changed a lot. I mean, today you have this uh, CBN tools, which can cut at a speed of 800 meters per minute. I mean, which is unheard of at one time. You also have quoted carbide tools. You know, the carbide tools also are quoted, uh, which also have the kind of, or not so much, but uh, but almost very high high level of high speed, almost six seven hundred meters per minute. And with this, there has been a lot of changes taking place. But here, I have only talked up to now about uh, machining or uh, on that aspect. The reason I talked so much about machining because so much of advancement has taken place over the period that this tells you how philosophy of manufacturing is changing. But having said this, I must also mention that similar advances has also taken place in other areas of manufacturing, such as fabrication, castings, and many other areas. In fabrication today, not only we use CNC machines, but we also use robots extensively. Uh, the use of plasma cutting, laser cutting, abrasive cutting, and advancement of welding technology and in all kinds of welding technology, including um, make, take, which are, which are more conventional, submerge arc, resistance welding. A huge application of resistance welding is always seen in auto, auto manufacturing, where they have a massive CNC machine, possibly there. I don't know whether, whether some of my young friends know that an automobile door has 86 parts. We don't realize that, okay? And these 86 parts have to be actually positioned and, and welded. And these, most of these weldings are um, resistant welding. And a CNC machine holds parts, brings it in position, touches it, you know, excites it, puts the, uh, puts the resistance welding down, take another one. I mean, it's quite amazing, actually, the amount of parts which is needed. Uh, I'm only gave a, I only give an example of what, what happens to this automated or advanced welding systems. I mean, it's, it cannot be done by human beings themselves. Uh, and so this one, all this has brought even, even this fabrication to a totally new level and uh, totally different. I must also share, we, we are used to fastening. Okay, well, since, since my early days, when I'm in industry, okay, fastening money, we said, okay, fastening means riveting, bolting, tightening. Of course, 
even even today the bolts have changed. I mean, the tensile strength of bolts has bolts have become 10 point, uh, 10, what's 8.8, 10.6 grades. But what has changed? Today, the fastening is done by a technology called hot bolting. Hot bolting, I do not know whether uh, some of you would certainly be knowing, hot bolting is basically a cold deformation. You have a bolt, there's a sleeve, and you compress and deform the sleeve to lock the bolt up. You see, you pull the, maybe three, four plates can be pulled together, a sleeve, and then the bolt is pushed out, just held, and the sleeve goes in, and you compress the sleeve while pulling the whole thing together, and it deforms and falls into the grooves, and then the machine itself cuts the extra length off. This is called hot bolting. And when, see, we, this is this is technology, how it changes. It's no longer tightened, it's no longer bolted. We don't never bolt it unless there are parts which requires to be bolted, meaning that parts which progressively requires to be replaced or changed or something like that, or taken out for maintenance, you only bolt those parts. Otherwise, you have a more secured uh, fastening like hug bolts. Now, I must also mention the continuous development of polymers. What we do not understand is polymer is totally changing the, totally changing the concept of manufacture. Uh, I don't know whether uh, some of you might know that, you know, when they form a body of a car, you know, the roof is put on position. The roof is not welded to the car. There is a kind of a high, for high grade glue. It's polymer actually, it's polymer, which is automatically spread and the roof is comes on the body and is put down, pressed down by robots, of course. You cannot do it manually. It pressed down, you give it a few, few seconds, it moves off and it's over. It's as hard as what we would have done in the normal welding. So polymer is totally changing the game. And of course, I'm aware that uh, possibly some of you would be more aware of that is uh, the engineering plastics. Okay, engineering plastics are totally changing the, the game. Is they are really the game changer in the industry is for future. They have been, I mean, so much of development has been taking place in these areas is unbelievable. Today, uh, I must also mention that today's manufacturing philosophy expects elimination of inspection as an operational process. One must cannot inspect, one cannot waste the time and money for doing the inspection, that's gone. And this can only, this, this concept or this philosophy can only be achieved with extremely high level of accuracy and consistency and when we talk in terms of what is the level of consistency, we say that it is 100 ppm or better. I mean, in general, general, general engineering, 100 parts per million can be rejected. Why do we do that? Is it is absolutely counterproductive and not cost effective to, to repair any parts. So when you have you see, when you talk in terms of 100 parts or even 200 or even 300 parts per million, you reject, you just pick it up and throw it away. Cost of that in 1 million, 200 parts is insignificant. It just is not uh, making, doesn't make a difference. We are talking about 200 parts, 100 parts or 200 parts per million, we throw away. This is the philosophy change. Earlier days, when we used to do it, it has gone bad, so we start uh, uh, rectifying it, trying to make it use. In fact, uh, long time back, I had a talk with one of the one of the country head of Mitsubishi in India. He told me that okay, during those times, of course, we were a little different. He says there is a difference in thought process in Japan and India. In India, you normally you like to say okay, this is your facility. Now this is the part which is required. Maybe this is the level of accuracy you required. And so you try to find a solution of how to produce that fine requirement of tolerances, 
with machine that or the equipment that you have. So you try to do different kinds of jigs, fishes, this, that, whatnot. In Japan, we don't work that way. We look at the part and we see whether this part no naturally can be made by this kind of machine. If not, we look for the machine to make the part. It's machine selection is done and we use any machine which can make these parts, not use a technique to make the part in the, your standard machines. No. So it was something that was eye-opening for to me for a long time back. This is, of course, I heard that many years back on the, the country head of Mitsubishi in India. Now, when we talk about after manufacturing, I must also mention to you that quality assurance. Now, you see, in our dictionary, manufacturing dictionary, now, you see, I'm, I'm sorry, I must also mention that what, whatever I've just talked about manufacturing, whether it's fabrication, whether it's machining, whether it is um, any other process, all this can only be done by the intellect level of trained, skilled and trained engineers. This is where we need them. This is where we, they can think about it, they can develop about it, and that's where we need them. Then we come to the quality assurance. You see, I have not used the word quality control. Well, that word is no longer valid. It's getting out of the dictionary. Inspection and quality control are the words which are moving out of manufacturing dictionary. We only talk about quality assurance. Quality assurance truly addresses on various factors, of course. It addresses material factor, manufacturing process, and machinery, machinery used. But Theory is more or less what the Japanese gentleman told me. The process guarantees naturally the high level of consistent quality, whatever is the quality. And as I also mentioned that we are talking in terms of 100 ppm, 200 ppms, that is the consistency the process requires. So quality assurance addresses the process. Is the process guarantees this? And that is what we talk about quality assurance, and this is a very, very, see, when I talk about automobile sector, see, once I talk to the Mercedes-Benz people and they say, that, look, our requirement is uh, 10 ppm. We will only accept a quality a level of 10 ppm, 10 parts per million rejection. Okay, that's, uh, uh, I mean, that can cannot be done unless your, your process Produces that it cannot be human. Human uh, skill themselves cannot do this. But another another area where we have now this. When I, okay, I'm sorry, but even in this quality assurance, because one has to address the process, one has to address the method of manufacture. Uh, that's a great area where engineers do a lot and make contribution, a lot of contributions. Now, another area which is little understood is supply chain. Supply chain is possibly one of the most critical areas of any manufacturing company, any. And it is where mechanical engineers have a very, very important role to play. When we talk about supply chain management of any company, it addresses what do we buy? How much do we buy? When do we buy? For whom do we buy and at what price do we buy? Okay, okay, there are subdivisions in this, but these are the basic questions a supply chain management has to answer. One of the critical role of engineers in supply chain area is to decide from whom to buy and at what price to buy. Please remember that any engineering company any manufacturing company has a material content is 60% of the sale price, which means is almost 70 or 75% of the costs. This is the real truth. So people do not realize how important is supply chain and how important is the decision-making level of supply chain. Now, the area which is from whom to buy and at what price to buy is an area which can only be addressed by highly experienced, skilled engineer. 
this requires vendor evaluation, validation, knowing how much would be the, and also knowing how much would be the cost, so that at what price to buy can be addressed properly. So he must know the manufacturing process and the time that's required and so on and so forth. This requires, when it, we talk about uh, vendor evaluation, the one actually looks at the manufacturing capability. I mean, does he have the right machine to do the job? Is the machine calibrated to do, to do the job? There are, of course, various techniques of doing it. Of course, I will not go into that, like sampling, zero, zero cities manufacturer, multiple bulk manufacturer. I'll not enter that area. But uh, what I'm trying to say that who can decide is whether the equipment is right, whether the quality system is right, whether the capacity is right, and the price is right. Now, all these require knowledge which only engineers can give most effectively, and that's why we use extensively the engineers uh, for supply chain management. And this is very critical. And a lot of, it's just not, you see, it's not purchasing. Okay. When we talk about supply chain, one is validation, which is truly, uh, which is truly the, not the planning. A purchase means these two answers from whom to buy and at what price to buy. And this can only be answered by engineers. And that's why the engineers have a very major role to play. And currently, the, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the currently the trend is, is also not to do the inspection. It's not a part of lean. The lean objective requires that there should be no inspection. So that also, Requires see all engineers. See, when I you, uh, the person may have a, when they go to the vendor, he ha may have the machine, but he may not have the knowledge how to produce it consistently in that machine. So an engineer goes to train to teach him how to do that. But ultimately, he has to ensure that it this consistency level of maybe hundred ppm that I'm talking about is comes from, even from him. Then only he is able to do that. So this is. That are, the engineers really contribute a great deal in developing the vendors to ensure that they have the right technology, the right uh, and quality consistency, delivery consistency, and also right productivity. Because if he cannot produce at a reasonable price and sell at a reasonable price, uh, he will be making losses. This is a challenge. So this is where the engineers come in in a very, very major way. Of course, there are many aspects, uh, management aspects, which are actually also very relevant. And uh, uh, see, we have uh, the issues like continuous evaluation, continuous improvement, and so on and so forth. And there are many techniques and many management. Actually, these things actually came up in a very big way for in Japan, and particularly in Toyota. They were the pioneer in bringing in some of the totally different concepts of manufacture, like TQM, JIT, quality circle, Kaizen, DMAIC, DMAIC, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, and go round and round and round and circle till you reach the perfection. And of course, many other tools of lean techniques. There are many other technology which transforms it. I'll just mention two of them right now, uh, which transforms a company. One of them is value engineering. Value engineering is quite an amazing concept and practiced extensively by the engineers who understand very well. It is different than <clears throat> Pivus or Kaizen. It's value engineering is a designing concept, utility concept, okay. Is this required? Does it is this value justifies the cost? Does it what does it deliver? So value engineering is one one concept which is extensively used, and the other one is what is called constraint analysis. Okay, there's a, there was one one great uh, manufacturing philosopher 
who had written many books on that, uh, Mr. Goldratt. His famous book is The Goal. The Goal actually de deals with constraint analysis. That means uh, every 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 operation or every every company when they move forward, they'll find something is blocking it. In many ways, I mean, I'm not, not talking about the uh, skill, consistency, what I've talked about many ways. And constraint analysis is a tool which addresses the constraints, eliminates it. And it's kind of a chain. You eliminate one constraint, you move to the next one, you have another constraint. So it keeps on, it has to be solved one after another. And this is again where engineers have a great role to play in industry. Uh, I only like to state that all of these, whatever I say, the safety QM, the quality cycle, etc., what I've said, all these management techniques are group group techniques, actually. They can only be done in a group. And normally, the engineers, mechanical engineers, are the usually the leader of the group. They are the one whose understanding is possibly the best in this area. So in our company also, our these are also led by the engineers. Now, I have to bring a topic, which is how does academia cover each of these, what I have just mentioned, which the industry wants? And how does a student, engineering student, in a four year period and learn this? I mean, this is one of the uh, amazing uh, challenge or amazing, uh, what should I say, contradictions. You have to teach the engineers the basic engineering. It has to be done. But then how, when and how do they learn what is expected or required in the industry? Because then uh, how do we prepare them for the industry? The academia truly can train them the basic and applied sciences, and at best give them some flavor, some some concepts, some ideas. I still remember uh, Professor Bubalda used to teach us a little bit about this at one time. Okay, the teachers that I'm talking about, except Auchi, possibly none of would, most of you would not even remember their names, but uh, they were great teachers. And but in the industry, actually, is it like? Engineering is applied science. Industry's requirement is applied engineering. This is the difference. So how do the how do the how do the uh, engineers within a short span of four years do that? Now, in many parts of Europe, particularly in technically industrial nations like Germany, I'm throwing this as a concept to the academia who are present here today. Uh, particularly in industrial countries like Germany they have what is called dual system. Now this dual system in Germany is more for uh, uh, more, for, uh, more like uh, diploma engineers that we have here, but it's also followed extensively by engineering, uh, engineering schools, engineering, graduate engineering schools. In this system, an engineer, a student engineer is required to have 50% of his time on the academics and 50% of the time, he should be in the industry. Okay. In this method, the student gets an extensive exposure to the industry and its requirement, and also is gets his academic training done. And so by the time he comes out of the uh, college, he knows what industry is, what industry is all about, what is uh, expected of him, and it becomes easy for him to actually map his path. What does he want to do in life? I mean, when I, I mentioned at the very beginning that, okay, uh, I will go to production, we'll go to design, not knowing what is expected to be done by us. So it will not happen, they will map the path. In India, I'm aware that we do students send students for internship to various institutes, various industries. The problem is that internships are so short, four weeks, six weeks, and it's too short for any meaningful exposure. So we say, okay, please have a look at that. We have a look at that. But can we really give them any meaningful exposure? So logically, this, this gap remains. And this is a serious gap 
that we see in the industry. So after they come in, then we start preparing them for the industry again. So to bridge this gap, I would request the academia to talk with the authorities to the uh, Director of Technical Education and Central Ministry to find the ways where student, at least the final year student, it's very common in law. Is in, 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 is it people who study law in law colleges today? The final year, they only, only have academics for uh, half a year. Rest half a year, they have to do internship in one of the law firms. Similarly, is it possible for the final year students to have only 50% of the time in academic, academic uh, studies and rest 50% should be can be sent for industry. And industry would then be interested to give them specific projects. And these projects, the quality of the project and where it should be, it can be evaluated. The quality of the project and the project itself will be evaluated by the college or the uh, or the uh, board set up by the college to evaluate it, but it must have be given academic marks. Otherwise, why would they do, do that? I mean, they rather look at the academic uh, pursuing, pursuing. Now, this will be both advantages to the industry as well as advantages to the students. So I would request college to uh, the, the universities to look at these alternatives. Uh, See, uh, the reason I'm going back to the words, unfortunately, to going back to the words um, college, because uh, when I graduated, Chipur was an engineering college under Calcutta University, of course. But today, IIS is an university, right? So it's a, or Jadapur, of course, has always been a university. So that's why I'm going back to the words college I'm using. So you have to excuse me for that. The other alternative is nearly impossible. Other alternative would require huge investments by the colleges or, or institutes or universities into high grade machineries there so that they can be trained. In fact, I was asking some of these young students that how much of these machines have you used? You have these machines in your, in, in, in your university. They said, yes, we do. But I said, have you used it? And they said, no, not really. I mean, we have seen others using it, of course, but we haven't ourselves done that. So to train them in the manner in which I've asked for what industry expects, it will be a huge investment. I do not see any possibility of any university being given grants to invest that kind of money. So I would request only academia to have a look at that, whether they can be uh, partly uh, uh, can be academic and partly can be industry, at least in the, in the final year. Now, I have almost finished myself, but I'll just, I will just uh, end by telling a story to the young engineers or uh, young young uh, engineering students or young engineers who might be present today. And I must end with this story. Centuries ago, there was a village with a large meadow next to where cows used cows used to graze. They used to graze on the grass. Cow being cows always walked a crooked path munching the grass. Goats and smaller animals followed, and they also found it convenient to follow the track made by the cow and eat grass adjacent to the track, making it wider and wider. Sometime later, a market came up on the other side of the meadow. And people started to go to sell vegetables, grains, etc. Surely, when they found a relatively clean path, despite or if it being crooked, they tried to found it convenient to walk that path. And the path even became even wider and wider. Then village became large, slowly, as all villages finally happen. And then it became larger and one day they had a panchayat who for the convenience of the people made the crooked path into an asphalt coated road. Naturally, people found it very convenient to build houses next to the road and slowly and surely the, it became a town and then a city, but 
The crooked path remained as a main thoroughfare and no one understood why is it crooked. Surely, most of us have come across such crooked path in all our old, old cities, including our city of joy, and no one knows truly why. Uh, surely, and uh, you see, this is also uh, what happens in uh, industry. Surely, in almost all cities, all, all industry also have strange systems and people have forgotten why it is there. It's like a crooked path. Why it is there and stopped whether it is it relevant or not. This is called industry crooked path syndrome. My young friends, please do not walk a crooked path without challenging it without understanding why it is there and deciding whether it is relevant or not relevant. And if it is not relevant, please take measures to change it. This is my message to all of the young friends that we have here today. And while there is no substitute of surely no substitute for hard work, and you must also enjoy, you must enjoy what we do, what you do. And always remember that like everything else, Industry two works on 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time that you've given me. Thank you. Sir, I'm, I'm really, we, we couldn't just, uh, I mean, uh, go into any other concentration to concentrate into something else. In fact, when you move under compulsion, we feel tired. But when you move with enjoyment, you call it travel. It was an excellent travel for one hour, no, no doubt about it. And being a teacher for over 30 years, I myself is learning, though the manufacturing is not my specialization area. As the, I mean, the, as I'm formally conducting session, but so many senior experienced people are there. I think they will have a lot of interactions and the young students may also ask something. But before that, as a protocol, I must uh, mention some of the points, not going through these, each of the points you have mentioned again, because these are all re recorded lectures. These I made my points just because of my reference, your uh, guidance like a senior person like you. And in fact, from my previous uh, presentations in Bengal Chamber and other places, I never just could go through this part of your presentation because you are mostly talking on the professional issues in a professional senior in presence of people. But these are something which the younger generation, including myself, can learn something from the process of thinking. Yes, it, it, it is a really an excellent um, lecture, I mean, as you have carried through. And we call it that the uh, initially the people have the information. Then with the gathering of some information, it becomes knowledge and then it becomes wisdom. I must admit that with your such experience, it has become such a wisdom that though you have concentrated in the field of manufacturing, finally it has come up to the experience of any field of engineering. I must admit at least I feel like that. Though you have given the examples of manufacturing, but it is equally true for maybe design, maybe equally for, and so much integrated things. The right thing, I feel that the, for the students, they must understand, you, like your experience, you just uh, told that you gave your options for either design or production. I myself was just, I mean, I know from my experience in uh, campus interview in the V College in the final year, though I didn't join after graduation. Anyway, so there the question was, somebody asked me in which section? I told my answer was anything other than marketing. <laughs> I realized that it was something dangerous answer I have given because the person who came for interview, he's the senior most person of the marketing of that company. And he then just politely explained me how important is the marketing in an industry because it doesn't mean marketing is going to the market and telling people of selling like any vendors. It's something which needs technical knowledge. And interestingly, in interview period, that senior person has explained me because I was in the starting career and he realized the marketing has to know all the fields of connecting engineering. Otherwise, the good marketing cannot be done. And as that is, I mean, corroborated again in your lecture, sir. And honestly speaking, in industry and academia, both are changing. <coughs> like you started in uh, 60 years back when you just started your career, the subjects you have learned in your engineering and that was not practiced. Most of those things are not practiced currently. And I myself can admit that in academics also, what you started with learning, and then finally, I mean, what we are teaching now, some of the subjects are not at all taught that time at all. That is quite, that is the life. The change is the only fact of the life. And uh, uh, another important issue is actually that uh, interesting issue of that 
assembly line and other things you are mentioning. I'm just uh, recalling my experience. I'm originally from Uttarpara, my birthplace, and Hind Motor was the company where at least every neighborhood people were in that particular company. And I think that Hindustan Motors company was the basically one very good at that time, our graduation at training place for the people who can learn different aspects of manufacturing because automobile industry needs all those. As you have mentioned, 86 components are there in a door itself. So I just recall my experience. And finally, when I joined into the assembly line, at every four minute, one car is getting outside that particular uh, shop. And it was very interesting how the design has to be made so that the initial components are fabricated together. And finally, assembly has been done to get one car four minutes. So that's the concept the students have. And in fact, this gap between the learning and going to the industry, finally, I'm coming to that point, what you have mentioned which in Bengal Chamber also, we had a lot of initiatives. You also might be know, I mean, you know, surely know that the, the academia industry connect is one important issue. Though yes. we have tried, tried in India and abroad, there is a distinct difference. From my experience, I can tell that in uh, Lund University, Sweden, the largest company of the uh, Alpha Laval, the plate it exchange, they are, mm most important R&D unit is within the university campus. And it was incidentally just beside my apartment. And so I was very much curious. And then I suddenly came to know and the manager of the R&D section was at least spending sir, one to two days per week during the second half in our coffee shop and cafeteria and just chatting with the people to get the new ideas. Honestly, mm -hmm. speaking, this close interactions between the academia and industry and the similar experience I had in Germany and uh, KTH also, there this is lacking in india i i'm not blaming anybody but i'm just telling that this is really i mean uh, i mean reducing our overall output both academicians and the industry output and regarding your propositions of giving academic marks to the students i mean that some credit should be assigned in the internship is already taken into care by the aict okay Okay. So that's already taken into care, sir. And some of the institutes has taken the full six months, one semester internship is a compulsory part out of the four year course. That's wonderful. They have, they have already taken it up. And one important issue we have to think that means there it makes a, I mean, a large difference to which industry students has got the scope to go. There are possibilities that if the student doesn't get, because we tell it that the, I mean, feeling an elephant is depending on which, I mean, if it is, he is a, someone is blind, then he feels touching that particular part, elephant is that shape. It's not the truth. The elephant has to be looked as a whole. And that approach is, I mean, not in every company they can have. And there lies the limitations of the student's internship also. So the teachers has got a general tendency to explain, I mean, rather uh, give their own knowledge to the teachers, uh, students, whether they need it or not, that's not proper. And simultaneously, the industry should have that particular very close interactions with the academia to find out the which should be included in the academic curriculum. And in one of our actually workshop of taking industry input for the academic curriculum, as we're from industry, I'm mentioning those points. Interestingly, in mechanical engineering, if we think about you after graduation become an expert in the area of manufacturing industries mostly. But interestingly, mechanical engineering has got different I mean, uh, possible options. Some can go to the power uh, in, uh, generation, some can go to the uh, design sections, etc., etc., as part of the manufacturing itself. And now, interestingly, the, when we brought the people from different groups, and some can go to the consultancy, etc., they, uh, we just tried to took the uh, inputs of the different uh, companies, senior people. And there was a, I mean, it was some around five, six years back, there was a controversy because all people from that particular respective field are expecting that the mechanical engineering should majority part of that should be their discipline. So here there is a confusion because um, when producing a, for a student as an engineering graduate for four years, that to in a particular discipline, that has also so many branching because when you, I mean, from graduation, if somebody goes to the master's degree in academic field, then he realizes that in such a small specialization area, how much is to be known even more. And when somebody goes for the PhD, then focused even in a much narrow area, they realize how much knowledge is already, I mean, available in the literature. So based on that, what should be the ideal curriculum is a great challenge. But at least AICT is encouraging currently and in Jadapur University, and I'm sure that AICT is, uh, sorry, uh, I, uh, IIST is also taking care of that. I mean, having industry persons in the academic curriculum design is a standard practice now in most of the good engineering colleges. But obviously, I mean, making an ideal curriculum for the students to 
be i mean further after their graduation going to different fields is a very challenging thing because within four years and if six months also goes for the industry the internship then in three year i mean half month uh, uh, three and a half a year it is very difficult to distribute the contents and older contents has to be removed very efficiently that's the most important challenging because removing obsolescence is the important part because yes. that is very important because still if the teachers has got their own passion for what they learn rather than i mean filling up i mean the, what is needed for the students and updating them for something new that is very difficult but for the teachers also they have to remain student for all over their life i guess otherwise it's very difficult and close interactions with the industry academia is very much important so maybe i was a little bit emotional with your excellent presentations i mean i mean undoubtedly it was a general philosophical presentations with respect to overall any field but specifically some of the examples were only taken in mechanical engineering so after this my expression or reaction if i call it i am just inviting anybody i mean uh, from the audience they can ask their questions to mr shen because this is a very rare opportunity to have something clarified specifically those who are the young students they will come also i, I believe with their some of their questions with such an excellent presentation so now the floor is open for everybody professor shudip today i am achyut ghosh may i take your permission to have some comments on the lecture i heard from my friend first thing is if i try for 10 years i will not be able to give a lecture of this kind i was this absolutely amazed at my friend's grip of the mechanical engineering and the way he beautifully uh, expressed he is talking from his heart this i don't know what he has expressed today you cannot read books and go on giving a lecture like this i first thing i must thank my friend sri indrajit shen for for entertaining me and all the students i believe the students who has missed today's lecture he has missed something great so this is my first bouquet to my friend mr shen i will not be able to give a lecture like this since i don't know he has learnt it from his heart now one few things as he said it is uh, 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration that is true for all our subjects for whatever we do in life that is true today i am missing amitabh amitabh i don't know whether he is there i i am not seeing i am seeing komol i am seeing ashok i am seeing purandar but amitabh i am missing today i wish amitabh uh, listen sir, to not available answer. today sir he is not available today sir he is not available today he is not available but, <laughs> but uh, i'll request amitabh to listen to this lecture he even i will send i will send person, a person of amitabh's knowledge uh, can learn uh, can pick up a few items from uh, indrajit's lecture today so that's what i did pick up and uh, one thing is there with all these automations and everything but the human skill in reading the uh, automation the making the automation run is always there the human skill is all, the need for human skill always increasing the need for engineers are always increasing that is something which we cannot do away with with all our um, uh, automation engineering self learning tools self learning machines and all that one last item i'll recall here and then i leave the floor to other learned persons and students one thing is uh, he, he he how could he do uh, talk about the machines in such a deep way he is handling deep uh, manufacturing items like gear boxes and all for 30 years I, I remember one 
I, I designed one robot and manufactured for him. That is fitting the gears, uh, gear cutting machines, filling the blank to the gear cutting machine. That was a very uh, crude attempt, but it did work. But then he must have improved on it and all that. So I must thank my friend uh, and I, I thank myself for attending this lecture. Thank you. Oh, Chu, thank you. Uh, Professor De, thank you, both of you. Thank you so much for your kind comments, but I'm also a little embarrassed. It was just an ordinary lecture. I, 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 I just wanted to share what I've seen in the industry and what I expect from the young engineers coming to the industry. But thank you so much for the nice comment. It makes me feel very, very happy. Thank you. Floor is open for others. If uh, some seniors want to comment or the juniors has some queries. Yes, sir. To Indonesia, I'm uh, Amit Kamal, 1968, batch mechanical. Uh, I wish my students are here to listen to your lecture, as Ochuda said, rightly said. It is a wonderful lecture is from the heart, from the experience, and I'm sure our young students here, they got a lot out of it. And uh, let me trace back a little bit. So far, I, I'm also a teacher, but I teach in USA. Now, my message to the students, actually for my, my own students also here, I tell the same thing. As you are becoming an engineer, basically, you have got three choices. Earlier, when we are graduating, we had only two choices. Either go to graduate school or go for a corporate job. Now we have become another job. That is entrepreneurship. Yes. These are the three things we didn't have our own. But now we have a choice. So think about it, what it is. And another thing I'm telling you again as a teacher is that this is a data available that 70% of the jobs is not there right now for the babies who are born today. The jobs we are having now is their old job. They are changing, particularly with the so-called industry four, things are changing a lot. Yes. So frankly speaking, I tell my students the same thing. We don't teach you anything. Only thing we teach you one thing. How to learn new things, start old things, you know. So yes, 90% perspiration. So based on what you know, start building. You keep changing. That's the only way you can do it. There's uh, no other way you can survive, you cannot. Uh, Finally, I don't know if it's the right forum or not, but in Rajit, I'm asking a question. Given, again, I don't want to be political here, but just in general, the COVID has shown us one thing. The supply chain has been totally disrupted. The, the one single supplier, China machinery, is no more viable. It has changed, disrupted the supply chain. It has disrupted the delivery time. It has thrown out the window the cost structure. So industry for distribution manufacturing is up and coming. What is your thought as an alternative model of manufacturing in the future? And what could be the India's role in the distributed manufacturing? I know it may be, it's, it's a long talk by itself, but- It's you know, a long talk by itself. Can I call you Komal because you're sure. so much younger than me? Absolutely. Okay. Kamal, what you said, you see, the reason I did not touch Industry 4 is uh, because it's also one of the subjects, it should be addressed on its own, actually. it's uh, It could not be a part of the any other topic, so I did not address it. But talking about this uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis, of course, uh, it is not only that uh, is this COVID and more so because of the uh, complete disruption of supplies from China, and China's controlling most of the, uh, a lot of minerals, actually, metal metals. Uh, and this is creating a huge problem. But it's not only the problem that 
we are facing in India, and but it's a problem that is being faced globally. I fully agree with you that every every supply systems have been shot totally. In fact, uh, uh, there's no company. We we import a lot of things from Germany, from uh, Europe, from uh, other countries. Nothing is available, and nothing is. Nobody is maintaining delivery. So the whole structure of uh, uh, the thought process, you see, what had never been factored in the whole uh, manufacturing plans or supply chain plan was such eventuality. I mean, nobody really planned for it. So uh, maybe with the, with the advancement of uh, digitization and uh, better uh, data analytics, one could predict one could prepare for it better in future, but really today we are facing serious problem. Um, I mean, China has created, it's just not only China, in fact, uh, all over the world, it's a huge problem right now. But but this is also something that what has happened in India, this I must also share with you and also happened in many other countries, that there was a period where demands, actual demands collapsed, it folded also because there was no requirement, it simply folded. Nobody wanted to invest <clears throat> money. Nobody wanted to uh, spend money on that. So it compressed, got compressed. But that is happened, what has happened after that, as soon as the COVID situation went off, this has started escalating and booming actually. Today, most, com most companies have a huge business backlog because they're all full and they cannot meet the demand. That's the situation, which means pent up energy has come back to the field so that's creating a new source of problem. But uh, talking about it, uh, uh, see, uh, I would not, uh, I mean, surely uh, Industry 4.0 is a very big topic to be discussed, but then this is uh, like too long to take it up today. No, thank you. No, no that's good enough. No, I knew it's a long topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indrajit. Thank you. Thank you. Kamal, thank you so much. I think Professor Malik was raised his, raised his hand, so he can have some interaction, sir. Well, following the B college tradition, I take the liberty of calling Indrajit Da, because I am six years junior to you in B college. <laughs> yes. So, Indrajit Da, at our age, it is very difficult to listen to somebody speaking for one hour, because <laughs> we got used to speaking ourselves and the students listen to us. This was an excellent lecture where I tell you honestly, with rapt attention, I followed each and every one. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one question because yes. you know this is possible only in India that you could have an academic job in mechanical engineering department without serving in any industry forever. And I am not the solitary exception. Even my Famous teacher, Professor Amitabha Ghosh, also, I don't think, had any so-called industrial experience. No, Amitabha did not have. He a PhD lecturer, president professor, professor, and, you know, super professor. Amitabha so, became director. So this is the difference I saw in Germany, that you cannot become a mechanical engineering professor unless you have at least five years industrial experience. <clears throat> you can become a professor in mathematics, but not in mechanical engineering. And about this internship, I have a simple question, sir. Yes. Because you know, in the departments or in any academic institute, everybody, every person thinks his subject is the most important. It cannot be cut. It must be taught. It must be compulsory, not even elective. So there, to take away another one semester from a four-year program oh. will be almost uh, unacceptable to the, I can say, 100% of the academicians. So, sir, is it possible that industry take the responsibility of training the engineers for six months on their own cost? Because he will serve you. Sure. So don't, and that will be I, the effect because we will not be able to give the training that is really needed. I can teach him more maths, more applied mechanics, more vibration, more theory of machines, <clears> more strength <throat> of materials, you tell it. But I will not be able to tell you anything worthwhile learning from me which will be useful in the industry directly. Industrial in problems the, and consultancy, because that was a very you know narrow problem, a particular vibration problem. My friend who was in the industry, also, can you come? Prunder is here. So 
to put in there can say it. He will call me also, can you come and have a look at it and see whatever comes to your mind. Mm-hmm. And I saw that thing for the first time. And we decided something and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. Fine. Indra, I like to answer it. Please permit me. Please, also, please do. I, I, I like to answer you. All industry in India today, barring none, are giving two years of their time and paying the first uh, uh, recruiter two years for training on their own house. That is, uh, that is not six months. They are no, 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 no. I'm, what I'm trying to tell that internship, don't trust it on the academician or in the academic institute, it will not work. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Because I, what happened I, I, like, I, I, let, I, I, let, 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 just let, let me come please. please, let me come to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. In Infosys, because yeah. they could recruit a large number of people, they forced a private engineering college in Odisha that you teach in the final year exactly what we give as training. Then we will recruit your people immediately. Okay. So, that being a private engineering college, they thought this will be an excellent advertisement for them that our all graduates got immediate jobs and that too in Infosys. Mm. Okay. So yes. that, these things, you know, very difficult. It is very easy to uh, dream or imagine. But I tell you honestly, with folded hands, with a, as I said, there is, I'm not trying to criticize your lecture or your suggestions, sir. I'm nobody. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic lecture which came really from a person who knew this stuff. But this industrial training by academicians like me will be a total failure. No, I agree. I agree that industrial training has to be... You see, there is an issue of, as you have rightly mentioned, that uh, you see, so much has been... Uh, and I think uh, Professor Dale also mentioned that. So the extent of uh, knowledge which has to be transferred has increased so much today that taking away one semester out is a nearly an impossible challenge unless the whole profile of what is what to be taught is being re- readdressed. I share your views. <clears throat> just like, just only one more addition. Uh, you know, please. we were in class 11. We finished class 11, then went to Shippur, B College. So we again were taught lots of calculus and everything I have right from the basics. Then it became class 12. IIT said our first year program should be taught in school. And the students are under enormous pressure. The amount of material that is stuffed in the school, I do not think unless everybody is Newton or Einstein, they can assimilate it. JE has done the worst, you know, injury to the academics of this country. I being an IIT professor, I'm telling you, I believe in it. I had enormous argument with Amitabha that one stage. Now Amitabha agrees. <laughs> because... <laughs> You, you know, you have to force people to think. That is that is teaching. Yes. I can, the medium may be theory of machines, medium may be strength of materials, medium may be mathematics. But force the students to think. If you can teach his person how to think, he will solve every problem. Need not be taught. Nothing can be taught. Everything can be learned. But how to learn, that should be taught. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, as you know, that uh, even in business schools, in business schools in the United States, uh, you cannot join a business school unless you have spent two years in industry. You're not allowed, actually, because it make business school will not make any sense to him unless he has spent some time in the business. Right. You should know what you are learning. <laughs> unless you have learned in the business, be in the business for two years. I, I, How do you know what should you learn? But, you know, the reason I raised it with the ac- 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 academics today is because surely industry is also uncertain honestly how to go about it and how to address it and unless ac- academia and industry works together to really see how to make uh, the engineers uh, effective very quickly is why I really make, them, the make them make them employable one of my friends used to say yes. our most of our engineers are not unemployed they are unemployable <laughs> i do not know that uh, but <laughs> But is it the reason I... The reason you will also give a lecture in this series. No, no, I, tell I, I can why. tell his name also. I tell you why. In fact, even before we started uh, the, the lecture, I was sharing my views because of uh, two of the students or, uh, you know, we take uh, selectively, we take management uh, trainees and what we have taken from Shipur and Jadavur, they are extraordinarily brilliant. In fact, I must say that Achut... Uh, we requested Achyut Ghosh to do the 
selection for us at one time and uh, what we have got received is absolutely outstanding outstanding students and it is for our responsibility now to nurture them to become high end professionals that's it the so, credit goes to sudip to de and sudip goes <laughs> they have taught those students yes i agree with that also i agree with that uh, one one more thing i like to add here as i am i am taking the time from other people but i must one is was sudip to professor sudip to they have summed up the uh, statement of indrajit sen beautifully i appreciate that uh, summing up and second is i was getting um, uh, feedback on this lectures to this i request sudip to uh, ghosh to uh, say that when they are sending the request for the ninth lecture what they will do very shortly they must put a list of all the uh, addresses portal addresses for the eighth lecture. lecture not only not only the last lecture they prepare a chart uh, a, a, okay. a, a table for all the eight lectures uh, the youtube ad, uh, portals and mm -hmm. whenever they are giving the next lecture kindly add this so that anybody can uh, can, mm. cannot have to but this will that. get longer that is the problem no doesn't matter but it is it's the same way. channel it's the same channel on the youtube once you enter the channel you will get all the lectures there at one place okay, okay. I, have, I, have, i have one question do i have any questions from but the, we'll the to young to friends yeah them. from the students from the students if yes. they can also yes. yeah, yeah, is there any questions from them yeah something in the chat box if it is there please organize us check also okay nothing in the chat box as i can see <laughs> okay any of the students they, they they just want to ask anything no so i maybe, think the same with so much is the same because what i talked yeah. about industry is uh, generally unknown as as of now not till they come to industry when they come to industry their questions will start that's what i see yeah yeah before going to the, i mean the industry they they might have these as a, as, a, as i am telling this information input not the knowledge i mean what i, agree. I, agree. I totally agree with that yeah. and i understand that because i would have been in the same position uh, while i was coming out of the college surely and sir i can tell you that in chamber i have associated you know better than more than 15 years i am associated with chamber interestingly some of my colleagues were also frowning on me what the hell you are wasting your time and this is the perceptions of the academic scenario of, of india <laughs> and what sir mallik has mentioned i rightly i mean equating him that in joint entrance advanced examination the students have to cover up honors level syllabus of physics chemistry mathematics and these things are repeated in the engineering courses so thermodynamics they have to learn to that extent in physics and if they have to repeat it again in the subject of engineering learning then what is the use of pushing only one purpose it is serving elimination of students out of the available seats in the most coveted iit seats and so that's the, sometimes you have to they have to unlearn not relearn yes sir absolutely i agree and the physics learning process sometimes depending on the teachers and instructions and the method they have been learned to solve the multiple choice questions they are sometimes creating so much problem they have to unlearn before going to the actually relearning absolutely i agree fully sir with you and this is a very important input to the students don't yeah. think that crossing the examinations competitive exam ends yeah. your life learning innovatively is the most important aspect of the i mean overall career but our academic system does not give them time to ask questions you see right now after this excellent lecture not a single student asked into the, the some question because they have forgotten how to ask questions because they are being taught so much from one teach coaching class to another coaching class i see my grandson i said pity they don't go to the field in the afternoon they go from chess coaching class to maths coaching class then to general knowledge coaching class have you ever heard that you have to go for coaching for general knowledge <laughs> no no i am getting old i am getting you know angry i am getting everything no, no, no. i understand See, that there is that. some thorough change has to come so in your so you put us rightly but i have to yeah. side with the side with the young students there i have to say that truly as you have said or should that uh, they are under tremendous amount of academic pressure all the time and uh, and when they come across a, a, a topic which is not aligned 
generally with the academic uh, areas where they are very comfortable, of course. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for them to ask questions because they are not exposed to that. That's exactly what I was repeatedly say, trying to say that they have to be exposed. Huh? So I, I am siding with them. If I were in their position, I would not ask the question also. The point? That's it. No, sir. Even <laughs> after the lecture, <laughs> we asked them. In fact, I gave, you will be given two marks if you can ask a question which no other student can answer. <laughs> and if I cannot answer it immediately, I'll give you five marks in the final exam. <laughs> that kind of incentive I had to provide. And ID can't put, gave me this strategy. Perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> students today have many choices. It is not the fault. They have of many the, choices today. It is the fault of yeah. the system. System is mm -hmm. forcing them to go in that direction. Yeah, I, know, I know. I know. Yeah. It is. It is there are, are shortfalls in system. System. One of the academic challenges, actually, I can understand because uh, I understand that they, they've learned so much in short period of time, and then, then, uh, and currently because of the COVID, everything has again also in, even in academic areas, everything has gone crazy. I mean that's understandable, but again, I'm saying that <clears throat> that's what we are doing actually. That when people come to us, we take special care to see that they merge with the industry's requirement very quickly. But it's very difficult for students to, I mean, which one they prioritize. And you see, when you say that, that's what I've also mentioned, that if being with the industry for a longer period of time does not give them academic marks, then it's very challenging for them also, because they have to also do well in academic. That's a that's an issue. It's, that's a major issue, actually. So uh, actually, uh, that is what I would uh, uh, leave uh, uh, the academicians to uh, think about. Sir, myself, Santanu Das. Uh, uh -huh. Sir, I like to come into this discussion. I am an assistant professor in the Depart Department of Mechanical Engineering, IST Sipur. So, uh, Mullik sir has told one thing that is also in the... Uh, that most your your uh, uh, video is not on. Uh, so, I am in the home. That is why I am not... Okay, uh, okay. All right. Please, come in. Uh, so, the sir has told that is also in the news recent days that is most of our engineers are not unemployable are not employable so basically uh, i heard a lecture from uh, aict lecture from professor anindu chatterjee uh, you already know him basically very mm -hmm. so he said that if everybody is employable then who is going to give you jobs because in the indian in indian sectors the industry is not capable enough to give the jobs and this is a very particular problem to a country like us the india or china china has uh, solved this problem their own way but in india how to solve this problem so he has given this perspective so any comment on this sir if you uh, i would not uh, uh, i would not truly say that uh, uh, because then you try to look at the uh, uh, engineers who come out either completing their graduation or their masters, or even those who come out later on to the business school, not many of them are unemployed. I mean, they do get jobs. But they, I also agree with you that uh, they may not be able to get today because of uh, various reasons, the work that they would prefer. But again, the same question what is the work they prefer and what is the work they're looking for? That is what I was trying to address because they don't even know, they, they can't even map the path at the moment. But I would not say that, uh, okay, uh, I, I would not really say that, uh, sorry if I'm, if I'm differing with others, but I do not agree that they are not, uh, they are not employable. All engineers have the basic knowledge so sharp. Today, the engineers are very sharp very bright and they're of course they're employable but they also need to be uh, given a little more exposure to the industry the earlier it is better that's what i was trying to say so if on in the on you're talking about on in the chat right yes sir from iit kanpur yeah yeah so uh sir kindly unmute Molik, sir kindly unmute sir uh you're not audible there is so, written a book yes sir Yes, and sir. sustain a career in engineering. Sorry, yes. what is it? Build, Build sustain. and sustain a career in engineering. He okay. says things are changing so fast. 
Yes. If you are in IT, you will be obsolete the first test. Because IT is changing almost every three or five uh, years, you become obsolete. Yeah, learning has to go on. It's a continuous process. It's always a continuous process. Right. And it is the pyramid, we you know. <laughs> Only very few people at yeah. the top. <laughs> and the base is larger. So if something is falling from the middle, then only you can fill up. <laughs> okay. so we have to go up to that level. I, I, th I think Purandarda has something to say. And uh, from yes, India sir. perspective, he has tried to say multiple times. Uh, OK, Purandarda, please uh, give your input, because I think we need feedback from I'm India. Unmute Purandarda, please. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Why it's not getting unmute? Uh, now now, now I, I, we could hear you. Please. Yes. You're, Can you you're hear fine. me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you are not audible, please. Okay, all right. No, uh, I, uh, I personally feel that uh, the sort of uh, the straight line, straight jacketed industry concept uh, back in '67 when we graduated, and today, what is the industry? Are so much different. Not just for just the one industry per se. It is the type of industries, its trade, its methods. Uh, you know, if we we people spent seven to ten years in school, four years in college, and then we have to work 40 years. And when we work 40 years, if we happen to join an industry, uh, industry can be of many, many, many sectors. Probably one can make a list of 200, 300,000. No, no, and the functions are so much different. It's not that uh, uh, an industry in aluminium or an industry in steel or an industry in power or an IT or say an automobile uh, will have a common factor which can be taken for the uh, institute to really give them some sort of a today a boy comes out, he doesn't know even what is called a balance sheet. He doesn't know what is liability, what is asset. So I, I personally feel that it is the responsibility of the industry. Let, the, let those four years be for creating a more stronger base to absorb knowledge. And then when he joins, he should be able to learn because he doesn't know whether he will be in marketing, purchase, manufacturing, design. Uh, there are hundred odd areas. So I will I will not be too keen to consider that uh, uh, engineering study study of engineering in India is uh, probably should be designed for industry. It should be considered as a education by itself, like school. A little higher school. Okay, in Germany they have done because they had an industrial reconstruction, things like that. Uh, then industry should play a stronger role of, say, the first one year, taking him through what they will need because what Infosys will need and what Hero Motors will need or what Maruti will need, these are so distinctly different that for academic, academicians to really get a, get a feel for it and incorporate, I would rather suggest that let there be a little more interactive process between the industry and the education institute so that the students by and large understand uh, what it means to be in an industry. Because it, it, it is step by step going up. You have enough time to learn, uh, perform. If you are coming, what is what uh, um, uh, Indrajinda said is correct. That at the end of the day, if you are hardworking, if you are dedicated, if you are sincere, if you are willing to learn, and if you are willing to give your 100%, uh, there is no rocket science in any of the industry where you, you are not, it's like a trained nurse. You don't say that I am for typhoid, not for cancer, or you are you are trained for nursing, 
and then whatever type of patient or type of duty you will be given, you should be able to learn first and then move on. Uh, don't get stuck with a knowledge which may not be useful as you move for 35 years with a four years curriculum. It's, it's, I may be completely wrong. And, well, well, no, Purandaraji, you're right on this, actually. You're right on this, actually. I also, I also appreciate what you have just mentioned. That's... And one thing I will, I will um, Please. just add to finish what Ashok said. In any case, when I support Ashok, always people will say I'm biased. But uh, <laughs> what do you see? Like in industry, Indrajidda, you all, all of us say that unless you are willing to say where you are today, you will not be able to move to a bigger height after five years or 10 years. So right. understanding where you stay, where you are today and ability to go slowly to the destination with a roadmap is the correct thing. Now, unless we are willing to really acknowledge that huge variety of engineering colleges starting in state level, private level, uh, IST, IIT, everything. They, and we produce, we have seats, 18 lakhs to 20 lakh seats. We fill up about 12 to 14 lakhs. How do you really think India can absorb 14 lakhs or those 14 lakhs are truly employable? Uh, I think it's a serious thing the academicians should think uh, that uh, is it really are all employable or people uh, like the I, the, that I mentioned that we have MBA courses in private small places. And what they are taking, they are taking people who have scored in higher secondary 45% in something like that. And then they are converting them to a person with a certificate and then they are joining. Now just imagine this fact that they are joining at a salary well below diploma engineers. Well below diploma engineers. If the diploma engineers get 20,000, they are joining at 18,000. So to say that MBA per se is MBA, and I am also an MBA, this institute is also an MBA in Salt Lake. I think there also the question will come, are they really employable for the education and the perception you are calling it a management training. Now, when you say in USA, in, to get into Harvard, you need three years working experience. Uh, that is because the name of the course is business management. So right. you are expected to know a little bit, bit of business. Here, in the uh, sort of uh, engineering college, for mechanical engineer, let there be set of education which is all the time upgraded and kept at part to the modern trend, that's all. Not really tailor-made to suit a particular industry, whether I work in that industry, that's not the issue. Not, you can always have specialized courses. Let that be attended. Uh, I, I feel it's- uh, I think uh, you, you, have, you have a point there because, uh, okay, uh, you have a point there, but uh, in fact, industry would, from industry point of view, industry would also be very interested to know how they can. Uh, uh, you know, this is something that I had always talked about in in the Bengal Chamber when I was the president that uh, the industry has to know how they can interact more closely with academia, so that uh, we can at least give some input to the uh, students. But I also agree, fully agree with you because. A student well, at the engineering college level do not know whether they go for uh, power generation distribution or they go for automobile industry. He doesn't know. So in what way will they be prepared? Uh, that's what uh, what you are trying to say. And uh, I fully agree with you. But uh, And that's, uh, that is the paradox that we have to address, both academia and the industry has to address, that how do we uh, communicate with the students together to give them a better understanding of what would be their career path at a later point of time and help them to choose the right career path. This is always a challenge, you see. Uh, but I also agree uh, that this is also one of the worries that we have, what you have just mentioned, that uh, 
today because of many private colleges and many uh, private management courses. Uh, 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 we have some some concern, some concern uh, when you have uh, people from there. We, we are very particular also that we don't take those uh, colleges. We, we are particularly choosy, but then uh, it's also an issue of concern and it's becoming uh, what should I say is a uh, kind, kind of a big issue and uh, uh, without criticizing about it personally, but I would say that this is truly a very major challenge and uh, and also I agree that let the okay, uh, but then you see the our our concern is that if they do not have any idea of what the industry is all about, right? Then you cannot be an engineer. It becomes very difficult. Actually, that's what I was trying to tell. Now it is for academia to tell us what do they want the industries to do to make them a little more aware of what industry is all about, and then uh, we can work together with academia. That's what I wanted to say also. I just um, I, I get a, when we say uh, why I am an engineer if I don't know the industry. Can we put it a reverse way that uh, I am an engineer because I am able to learn what is an industry after getting out of the college? Sure, sure. In the IIT Kanpur, there is a joke that if you don't get a job after B, go for ME. If you don't get a job after ME, go for PhD. If you don't get a job after PhD, become a faculty. So higher education is disguised unemployment. You know, nobody is a salesman these days. Everybody is called a sales executive because he has an MBA degree. <laughs> I thought this. I, I thought that is. Is it? Is it also so at the moment? I don't think it's now so much because uh, we also people also in industry also looks for people who have got a higher academic. Qualification because no, are... I'm just this was a joke. I mean, this is not to be taken yes. seriously. This is not a <laughs> Our basic education has to be strengthened before you know, absolutely a more of top heavy structure. A class but, eight student but, cannot see. write his name, cannot do addition. Mm -hmm. Schools don't point have again. roofs, schools yes. don't have blackboards and classrooms. I mean, unless I'm, I'm yeah. agreeing. I mean, and we have to invest. For example, in of USA or Germany, academic institute. basic school education. Unless you improve that, you cannot make the top hit. You know, oh, very you small. Can. Ashok, you can. Ashok, you have seen in one of my industry, we have to invest in the institute because, for example, let's take whether it is IIT or it's uh, IST or a private engineering college. When we talk of a strength of material laboratory. There are a set of few equipments and for research, some specialized equipment, because that is all what can afford that area. Believe me, one of my industry, because there are two types of industry, one which can assimilate the development te technology and develop the product which has been developed already outside. And there are few who introduce such products as a global leader. Now, one thing I have seen in one of my uh, industry, I've seen we had six instruments. We had a tensile testing machine of thousand tons, which is two hundred meters long. Now, institutes we had fatigue testing machines, eight of them. Now, these, when we look at them, sometimes I feel that, that why we cannot invest, why we think investment in these educational institutes is wasted and only profit making entities can afford it uh, it's an excellent discussions participations of many seniors so i think the organizers are simultaneously happy and little bit unhappy because we are crossing time but they are happy that it's so much response of the people and we are coming to a meaningful thing discussion sir you are the muted sir. Of the lecture that only proves the quality of the lecture which i still want to say indojit the thanks a lot thank you thank you very much sir, if that chair allows me i can add a few points here yes please Sitoza, please, please. please. Uh, yes. as uh, mr sen was saying i mean what uh, what is expected from academics in fact that's really the problem that we are pondering upon i mean uh, what we need obviously is a good curriculum i think the curriculum is the uh, most critical thing that we need to develop uh, because the curriculum that we are having 
perhaps is not uh, pragmatic and practical. Yes, we have internship, we have industrial training, but I mean uh, something we have on paper but cannot really practice in you know in full sincerity. So that is one problem that we have. I mean, so we, and with the changing you know and with the expanding horizon, perhaps getting students trained on every aspect of mechanical engineering that is a big bang, that's really difficult. Because yeah, now students, even in, I mean, staying within mechanical, they have a lot of choices to make. I mean, that's why we don't find many of the students here today, because it's too much of industrial. They might be, I mean, some are leaning towards IT, some are leaning towards some other thing. So a lot many choices they have. And perhaps getting students trained on every aspect is really difficult. So, I mean, getting a balanced curriculum is indeed a difficulty today. Perhaps that's what I feel. Maybe Shweta can also uh, make comments on that, being in academics. And if I hand over to Mr. Shen uh, to answer that, I must say that the root of this, I feel personally, is the subject learning and love for the subject. These two are different. Because if the earning after learning is mandatory, otherwise the people cannot survive. But if there is some love associated with the learning, then something, whether it will be industry or academia or some uh, innovative uh, entrepreneurship, everything needs to be loved. And for the love, actually, our society has very little opportunity. Because, for example, I find out that some of the students liking very much the subjects related to mechanical engineering, they go for computer science just because their rank is higher. It should not be. The students should go according to their own choice. Those who like computer science, they should have the opportunity to go for computer science. It's not that their higher score is forcing them to go for computer science. So that now I'm, I mean, rather giving the. I like to add. I like to add here something, Indro. I am sorry. I am uh, sort of countering you. One thing is there that I am in this for 60 years in various colleges in the making uh, course structure. Uh, in the Jadapur University, in Kolani, everywhere, somehow I have become involved. So I got some experience together. I will say that make the engineer learn some basics of the behavior of the material and some basics of applied mechanics. I am talking about mechanical engineering. And rest, for the last six years, I am seeing that you cannot teach him anything more. He is, for four years, he is already preoccupied. And with this, he goes to the industry. Industry, to absorb him, will consume two, three, four years and will train him up and increase his salary as he goes on with the knowledge. The moment he gets that knowledge, he deserves the salary that he gets. That's what I have seen for the last 60 years. I don't think we can make very drastic change from this basic philosophy. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, that's also what we are doing right now, all of us. That's what has been done, what Achyut has just mentioned. That's how it's working now. In fact, uh, I think uh, Mr. Sen has rightly, very likely mentioned that engineering is applied sciences and industry needs applied engineering. It's very nice for that. We loved it. So there depends the gap, and the gap has to be bridged, I think. Thank you. So, so on behalf of the department and on behalf of the Centenary Celebration Committee, I must thank our speak today's speaker, Mr. Indrajit Sen, and our uh, senior alumnus. Thank you very much for coming here, sharing your experience and vast experience. In fact, today we heard an engineer who lived his life and for 60 years with the machines, I should say. So with so much, he, he was talking about machines, tolerances, and so, I mean, everything related to machines and products. I mean, I, I was amazed to hear this. So <laughs> I think uh, our colleagues have enjoyed it. Uh, thanks very much. I must also thank our today's chair, Professor Dev, my senior also. Uh, so thank you, Shwetoda, for leading the session so nicely. The discussion was really, really nice, I should I must also thank Kamalda join, joining from Texas. Uh, Professor Mollik has joined. Dr. Horches has also joined. So I, I, today I see a lot of uh, seniors joining here. So thank you, everybody. Uh, with that, uh, maybe we can close the session. I think, uh, Shwetada, any other points people are making? Not only, only, only I have this final comment. The, yes, after the discussion has continued over more than one hour, and that, that's that's the interesting part of this particular presentation. And when it, I mean, uh, uh, inspire people to discuss more, that means the content was so intense.
So I again, thanks to all, including the seniors who interacted. And I hope those students kept silent. They must got a lot of message from this discussion. I hope they will start interacting in next next uh, speeches. They may be a little bit frightened about these senior people, but they should also ask. They have a the lot of potential, I believe, from my students interacting with them. This is a lot from the so, students. Uh Myself, Tanishtha Bagh, currently UG six semester student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. I did have a question regarding the increasing trend of uh, core department, especially mechanical department students shifting towards IT jobs, either due to the payment scale or due to the lack of core jobs exactly, because as we know, the industry is getting increased, increasingly getting more uh, uh, interrelated to the other subjects and also with industry 4.0 and then the drive towards electronic vehicles. Uh, I feel that uh, all the domains which were under uh, mechanical engineering solely before are now getting more interdisciplinary and distributed into other uh, departments as well. So there is this thing and also there is right now when I uh, see around people have this general notion that uh, Mechanical engineers don't have much uh, jobs with them, which pay well. So even the parents of many students uh, forced them to go into IT sectors. I have personally met many seniors and juniors who are interested in mechanical and knowing the concepts, but they have shifted towards IT or CST because uh, one the uh, peer pressure, the parental pressure which they had, and the other point being that. This is what the industry is all about right now. So, Tanishta, Tanishta, is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tanishta, Tanishta, what you raised uh, <coughs> truly a very <coughs> sorry, a burning question. Okay, uh, it is true that uh, <coughs> some of the engineers, good good engineers, in disciplines like uh, hardcore engineering, like uh, mechanical, electrical, or others. Uh, they move ultimately to management, to consultancy services, to banking, and of course IT and ITE, because of the because of the uh, uh, what you mentioned about the salary structure, pay structure, so and so forth. But I can only tell you today that progressively, while it is not the same parity with uh, what they offer in banks or consulting the houses and uh, and also IT, but uh, <clears throat> progressively the requirement and importance of <clears throat> uh, properly trained engineer is becoming more and more dominant and uh, manufacturing industry or otherwise also other industries are recognizing this and uh, they are surely progressively position is improving and maybe in the next few years you'll possibly find them at par. Because it's always also a question of supply and demand situation. If we do not get uh, supply of high quality engineers in large numbers, when our demand is high, so that automatically everything starts increasing. Because you have to pay more for getting high quality people uh, in the industry. So, but I agree with you right now that there's also peer pressure, there's also a parental pressure because, and of course, the attraction of uh, getting a high salary job, but would you would you as an engineer be satisfied also with your work? That's a question. Huh? That's the. So I'll just I, add I, one I, last line for Nisha. Just, just, just one minute. Let this uh, here. Please, if you are interested to know your please, mind, actually. you say something, then I'll Tanisha, tell you. Tanisha, you uh, come yes, in. sir. Just yes, sir. Personally, like I have always been very attracted towards the mechanical engineering domain. Like starting from the school time itself, that like it's a very known fact that people usually don't think that uh, mechanical engineering is something for females. But uh, I always had my passion for this field, and right now too, I am looking forward to. Uh, be joining an uh, industry which is in the core domain itself because I personally feel that we need to love the job first. Otherwise, even a lot amount of money won't give you the satisfaction of doing the job. 
but I was just uh, uh, sharing the general concern around me, like uh, the students and what is the reaction of the parents towards it. So I wanted to know the uh, idea about the same, that like, what is it on the other side? Well, Tanisha, Tanisha, what yes. we I, say I, I, that if you are good, if you are good in a very short time, you catch up with any industry. You have to be good and then you catch up very fast. Even even if you're if you're in a hard course in, uh, in engineering uh, industry uh, or rather hardcore engineering subjects, you can catch up, but you have to be really very good and it happens. I will add here one line that is joining a consultancy without having five, 10 years field experience, industrial experience is, is a, is a dangerous thing. It's a, how but, can you be consulted? But Achyut, but Achyut was Tanisha is saying she's right that they are being offered. Huh? Uh, McKenzie gives offer, this company gives offer. But I gives it's offer. a scary ledge. It's a scary ledge for those companies. They are taking innocent people and making them consultant. How they can advise unless they don't themselves do not know the subject. But anyway, that's my view. But honestly, honestly, it's a it's a challenge that the young generation is facing right now. In fact, that is the issue. Huh? Or as the said, she, she wanted to be a mechanical engineer. I'm happy that she is. But then great, great. there would always be an attraction. Science, this, that, what not. But that is a, that is the social understanding today. The era, uh, yes, sir. sir, also a personal opinion, which I feel like since uh, you all already mentioned that right now, our age is very naive to understand which is the correct field in which we should go into. So at this point of time, when uh, these students are quite unclear about which domain is our interest, like where uh, we will get interested in where which job we will actually love. At that time, this uh, uh, money factor and parental pressure and all the other factors become more dominant into uh, dominant yeah. when we start choosing our career option. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, Maybe that's, that's what I was mentioning, Tanishta, but when I say that there should be a little more interaction between industry and academia. Yes. Uh, I, I think, uh, in fact, our student society, they are organizing a series uh, and they, uh, in, as part of that series, they also have uh, this industry academia meet. Uh, I would request Bidut. Bidut is looking after that our uh, student society, so he can interact with the students. I think students, some students are also here, so they could send the message there. I mean, an industry academia meet, and there, if they get uh, Mr. Shane and maybe Kamalda also, because they also need input from Texas, how they are doing managing their academy. So that will be an excellent session, I think. Vidut, uh, please look yes, into sir. that. Uh, possible, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, would be would be loving, sir. Yeah, you may, you may not, or... may not, you may not. Uh, I mean, take their, uh, much of their time for long lectures, but at least during panel session, you could uh, uh, request Mr. Sen or Professor Kamal Sarkar to come along and. Uh, yes, share sir. Their so this event is being planned for the twenty seventh of February. Uh, this is part of the students' uh, technical phase in Peters. And on the last day of the event, that is 27th of February, they have this industry academia meet. Uh, in 2020-20, we had this session in physical mode in February 2020. Uh, this year, we have to do it in online mode. Uh, on that particular day, we have got two sessions. Uh, one is on core engineering, where there, there will be few invited speakers from the industry talking about this industry academia gaps and how to bridge them. And also, we have another session uh, on the same day. Uh, that is going to talk about entrepreneurship and innovation. So I think uh, it will they be. They have liberty in inviting whatever they, I mean, whoever they like, but yeah. perhaps we could suggest them. I mean, so maybe we, we can suggest our student body uh, yeah. that please get in touch with uh, Mr. Sen, Professor Kamal Sorkar here, uh, also Dr. Purunda Bhattacharya. So it, if we can have your uh, interaction there as well in on that platform, I think our student community will be enriched. So yeah, I uh, think. And today we had the longest session, if we have noted. Today we had the longest session, but it was meaningful discussion. Uh, and one last thing I would request our chair to formally and virtually hand over this uh, you know, certificate of appreciation to our speaker. We'll be sending the uh, short copy through, uh, soft copy through mail and hard yes. copy with a memento through, through our career. Yes. So 
So I happens. must say, I must say that I'm really honored actually to be here. I'm very glad to have interacted with uh, all of you. Uh, really, it has been a great honor and great pleasure for me. Thank, Thank you, sir. I mean, it was told that the parents and the I mean, alma mater are coming to their compulsory options are rather they are not being choice, they are being given to us. So we can never ignore our parents, we can never ignore our alma mater. So from there, I'm also being from the same institute, it's my honor to tell you, sir, it's a great lecture with good interactions with many seniors and also the junior students will start thinking. And this is a token of appreciations for our gratitude towards you, sir, at the closing right. of the session. And longest thank interaction, so longest interaction after lecture. We must thank say. you so much. Thank you, sir. So thank you everybody joining this online session. So we'll see, meet, uh, meet again next week, same time, same day, same time. So thank you. Perhaps we can close it. We can stop the recording. Vidut, your team, please. Uh, yeah, Dr. Das, please. I'm